So what is financial abuse? Some call it hidden abuse. Some call it emotional abuse. It's a subject that in the past has not gotten a lot of coverage because you're not really being abused outright in the open. You know, you're not being hit, called names. So a lot of times victims think, well, you know, there's no abuse going on and they don't really know what to call this. I would like to call it gaslighting mixed with money. <laughs> you know, it's like, you think your bills are paid? Uh, no, they're not. That was a distorted false reality. Um, you think you can trust this person with your money? No, you can't. You cannot. <laughs> Um, you think they just fell on hard times. No, they didn't. This is a pattern of self-created financial crisis so that they can financially exploit you. And it's a pattern. It's not changing. It's a coping mechanism. It's a modus operandi. This, this is how they are. <laughs> For those of you who don't recall some of my other videos on gaslighting, let me just remind you gaslighting. They are tactics used by narcs to get you to question reality. And so yeah, when you mix the gaslighting with bills, this is what you get. Um, it is emotional, psychological abuse. It involves guilt, fear, anger, emotional strong arming. Okay, so let me give you an example of how this tends to play out. Personal example. Many, many years ago when my three children were very small, I learned that my ex had not paid the light bill in three months. And I know some of you are wondering, my gosh, how did he get over, get that over on you? Well, you know, back then you could go about three months uh, without paying before they'd shut off your electricity. Maybe in some areas they still do that. Uh, I don't see that happening anymore. But back then that was the case. And, you know, how he pulled it over on me. Well, you know, that's something I'll maybe explain in upcoming videos. But those of you who've been through this, you probably understand, okay? So I find out one day because, wow, you know, the electric gets cut off and I'm sitting there in this house with these three small children, you know, in the hot summer heat in the south. Uh, no electric can't, you know, get any hot running water. I also find out that the car he's driving is not even legal, it's stolen. So I don't know what to do. I mean, I've got three children. I can't really um, call anybody for help because number one, there's the humili humiliation factor of people in the family who have already shown a lack of support and they don't wanna get involved. So what does that leave me with? That leaves me going to a women's shelter. So I take the kids over there and the lady who was checking me in was interviewing me and asked, so what happened? What did he do? I mean, was he calling you names? Did he lay hands on you? Did he threaten you? And I've got this kind of confused, perplexed look on my face because I don't know how to explain this to them. I'm grappling to find the words like, you know, she wants it short and sweet. Is it emotional abuse? Is it physical? Is it sexual? Is it, you know, what is it? And, and I just can't find a nice, neat package to wrap this up in for her. So I start explaining. And the first thing out of my mouth, the best I could come up with was financial abuse. Now, this was about Gosh, this was in the early 2000s. So back then, you would never hear this term. That was an, a bizarre term. And so when I said financial abuse, because that's the best word I could put on it at the time, even though I'd never heard of it, and it seemed even bizarre to me. You know, she looked at me kind of crazy, and I felt kind of crazy saying it too. You know, she's looking at me like, what, what, what's wrong, honey? Financial abuse. What? He didn't um, buy you the jewelry you wanted. He didn't buy you the brand new car you wanted. You didn't get the neighborhood you wanted to live in. I mean, 
it, it sounds ridiculous off the cuff. And then I start explaining to her, well, you know, he cut the lights off. He, he, he told me he paid and he didn't. She goes, oh, honey, that's emotional abuse. So this is a kind of abuse that plays with your emotions, plays upon your trust. And it's very common in narcissistic relationships. It's a way to diminish and disempower the other person. And unfortunately, it's normalized in narc relationships. It's just the way it goes in many narc relationships, because frankly, the narcissist cannot function without it, without the toxic financial supply that you are providing them. So basically, in this kind of relationship, the narc gets their victim or their target to prove their love, right? You got to prove your love by paying for it dearly. And when you can't or when you won't, then you're going to be discarded in order to get free of it yourself. You're going to have to discard them by basically going no contact because they're never going to change. They'll forever exploit your finances and resources like a parasite, even years after a divorce, through, say, unpaid child support. They make it almost financially impossible for you to leave or to recover from leaving. And a lot of times when you do leave, it's quite dramatic and it can take you years to recover because the parasitic nature is oftentimes at an extreme. In this relationship, you will not be treated as an equal person with equal access to funds. Even if it's your money, even if you've been married, you know, and you live in a community property state, and you have children, and you have definitely provided You could argue it up, down, left, and right in a court of law, but in the mind of the narc, you are not equal. You do not deserve equal access to funds. And I'm here to tell you, you do. You deserve to be treated as an equal. Some of you are wondering, why do narcs do this? I want to remind you, especially for those of you who are new to the subject of narcissism or you haven't read my book, where I go into a lot more detail about the psychology of what drives a narcissist to behave this way, not just with money, but concerning everything in their relationships. The reality is that they're very insecure people. Yeah, they might put on a very strong front of confidence and success, particularly if we're talking about a malignant narc. But deep down, they're very insecure people. They project a false image that is very expensive or costly to maintain. And they have no core values to create security for you, much less themselves. Actually, they're relying on you for that. You are their supply. And when you run out of supply, when they drain you like a parasite, that's when you get discarded and they get onto the next supply source. Another reason narcs do this is because they're character deficient. They're aware, but they just don't care. And I've said that a lot in my book. They can play it off like they don't know what they're doing to other people. They are actually, and and there's been a lot of studies showing, I mean, long in the past, people theorize, oh, they don't really know what they're doing. It's subconscious, whatever. No, there's enough psychological research out there by now to prove that they are conscious of what they're doing. They are just without a conscience. There's a big difference. Conscious without a conscience. They're aware. They just don't care because they're character deficient. This is their MO. This is another reason why they do this, okay? Their way of living, their mode of operating is to take to get. While victims, the people that they prey upon tend to give to get. And I talk about this a lot in my book uh, about how usually both parties are right there at different extremes. There's no equal give and take in their relationships because, you know, whether we're talking about the narc or the narc magnet, both were usually raised by emotionally negligent parents 
or parents who are narcissistic. So you learn in that relationship by a matter of survival. If you, if you want to survive in this family dynamic, if you want to have any chance of getting your needs met, you're either going to become a narc and take to get, or you're going to become the victim of narcissists, like a codependent or an empath, and you're going to give to get. It's coping. Another reason, finally, why narcs do this, well, they're very much like children who never learned how to share. They can't share emotions. They can't share responsibility. They can't share risk. Oh, they might put on a good front in the very beginning of the relationship, to the contrary. But when they're actually called to the carpet, it's a no-show. They can't deliver. If you want to watch the next video in this series, then click here. Or if you want to watch my narcissism playlist, click here. Also, if you're interested in my book on narcissism, check it out at Amazon, Audible, Kindle. Links are down below. Till next time, thanks for watching, commenting, liking, sharing, and subscribing.